Good morning, Greater Faith again. Good morning, those of you who are joining us via Facebook. We thank and praise and bless God for each of you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are um, just in the process of connecting. We've had a couple of technical difficulties today, so we're hoping that those will resolve themselves. I think every time Facebook does an update, um, I guess I have to learn it all over again. But nevertheless, we thank and, and appreciate you guys um, for joining us. I do see Virginia Riddick's joining us, Tanya's joining us, um, Whitney is joining us. Thank you all so much. And then, of course, we have our Greater Faith family um, in our Zoom church, <laughs> so to speak. I, I laugh every time I say that. Um, so we thank you all so much for joining us this morning. I want to say good morning to Sister Stevenson. Good morning to Leading Lady. Thank you so much for joining us on Facebook Live as well. Let's go right ahead. Good morning, Kim. That's my best friend. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I want to jump right into the Word of God today. We are going to um, just um, pray God's blessing over what He wants to do, the Word that He wants to um, the people of God to hear today. And um, we'll see what He does and how He blesses us through His Word. So we'll start with prayer, and babe, do you mind leading us in prayer today? No, not at all. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Let every heart pray. Father God, we just simply come before you today to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for our sins, Father. Mm -hmm. Father, as we enter this Christmas season, uh, let us not lose sight of that. Um, uh, that Christ is the reason for the season. Mm -hmm. Father, we lift up our nation to you, Father. We lift up those who are still hurting financially, uh, physically, mentally, um, as well as um, emotionally from this pandemic, Father, and all the strife that's going on in our nation. And Father, we ask that you would heal our land. Father, we trust you and we love you. Um, we just ask that you would have your way today. Uh, Give Wanda a, a fresh anointing, Father, mm -hmm. from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. And Father, speak through her. Give us a word, Father, that's going to sustain us. But more than that, Father, give us a word that's going to help us to become more mature Christians. Have your way, Father. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, babe, for for leading us in prayer and setting the atmosphere this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew, the first chapter, and the 21st verse. Matthew, the first chapter, and the 21st verse. Matthew 1, 21. And then also connect with me um, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 4th through the 14th verse. And I've shared with you, um, if you all remember a little bit, um, a little bit while ago, I shared with you that um, we were going to be talking about Christmas and um, kind of sort of just a little bit more about the season. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Matthew one twenty one, and then Hebrews 10, 4 through 14. Um, Matthew one twenty one says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Hebrews 10, 4 through 14 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings, and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all. Day after day, every priest stands perform, and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever 
those who are being made holy. Amen. I want to talk to you from the topic today. What do you do when your purpose is to die? What do you do when your purpose is to die? What do you do when your purpose is to die? I've noticed that in a lot of um, ministry appointments and a lot of Bible, we talk about it in Bible study, when I do women's conferences, even youth conferences, actually, I always deal with the question or I'm always asked the question, how can I determine what my purpose is? How can I decide? How do I know what my purpose is? Why am I here? Why was I born? When this question is raised to me, I go through the process of sharing how we are created in the image of God. And while we're all different with different likes, different tastes, different dislikes, our ultimate purpose is to walk in obedience to God and live in a way that makes him proud and that gives him glory. The how of this, we know what we're supposed to do, but how we do it is often different based on your likes, based on your dislikes, based on your talents, and based on your gifts. Um, some people yield, yield their life to God um, and give God glory by helping others. It could be in the nursing profession, in the pastoral profession, um, in, in the profession of working with the nonprofit. And those are your careers, but God often uses those careers, what our gifts and our talents are to bring him glory. And it's in that a lot of times that we find our purpose. And then some people's um, gifts or purpose may be in being an advocate for others, lawyers, for example. There are a lot of good politicians who work on a regular basis to make sure they make the lives of others better. So whatever it is that you're called to do, however you choose to use your talents and your gifts, it's important to understand that Christians should include the process of seeking God for direction in terms of how you should please him. So before you move forward with trying to figure out what your purpose is, the first thing that we've got to do is ask God for direction, seek God for guidance on our purpose. So let's look at this from another perspective. Let me, let me get you to think about something. What do you do though, when your purpose is to die? What do you do? How do you handle it? If you knew from the time that you were born that your entire life purpose, the purpose for you coming to heaven is so that in God's chosen time, you would be killed for the sake of somebody else. How would it be that if on March 4th, I knew that when the Lord came and, and he birthed me into the belly of Mary, which, you know, you know, Mary and Elton, though, my parents, and, and, you know, I knew that from that time that my whole purpose was to die. That's the reason why I was living. What would you do? Um, how would you handle that? You know, once you're born and everybody knows the Bible says that we should um, be upset or have, we should mourn at the death of a child. We should rejoice when people actually, I mean, mourn at the birth of a child and we should um, be um, happy when somebody dies. So with that being said, how would you feel if you're born and there's so much of a celebration around you? I mean, the angels are rejoicing. People come from all over to bring you gifts. They worship you. But yet and still, the one purpose that you came for, that only purpose is not to receive all this honor, not to receive all of this glory, but the one purpose is so that you can die. Let's look at this. Hebrews 10 4 through 14 gives us an example of the conversation, check this out, the conversation that Christ had with the Father before leaving heaven. As Christ is saying his final goodbyes, he says to the Father, he says, you know what, you haven't been satisfied with the blood of animals as sacrifices, so instead, you've prepared a body for me so that I can go into the world and be the final and ultimate sacrifice. And Jesus says, I'm going to do it, not because I want to, but I'm going to do it because it is the will of the Father. <laughs> That's the reason why I'm going to do it, because it is the will of the Father. So what do you do when your purpose is to die? First of all, you, your ultimate goal is to please the Father and to obey the will of the Father. And, and and this is something that I was thinking about this. I, I have worked with kids pretty much all my life as a youth pastor and then as an executive director of a place in Kinston called The Gate. I worked with them for about eight to 10 years. 
And this is the thing. If it's one thing that bothers me is when you ask a child to do something and they give you a whole lot of lip back. <laughs> I mean, it just bothers me, especially when the child and, and, and they're called the child for a reason. When they don't know the ins and outs of why you're telling them to do something or not to do something, you say, hey, go give me that piece of paper and they don't move. Or they say, go do, you ask them to do this and they don't move. They're not moved by what you say as an adult. That bothers me. And it bothers me so much that I thought of that because here we have Jesus who is the ultimate sacrifice. He is the the um, the second person of the Trinity. But yet and still, when God the Father asked him to do something, he moves. <laughs> he, he moves. He does what's asked. He's the second person of the Trinity, but he does what's asked of him. There is no negotiation. There is no compromise. There is no conversation. There is no discussion. It is simply an acknowledgement of his purpose and the acceptance of the task at hand. I want to make sure you get that because that's important. When he is called when he's having this conversation as he's about ready to leave heaven there is simply an acknowledgement God this is why you're calling me this is my purposes purpose and then there's an acknowledgement that there's a task at hand he yields his will to the will of the father and so whatever he has to go through whatever it is that he has to suffer whatever it is that he has to deal with he is willing to do it because it is the will of the father so the very first thing that you that that happens when you know that your purpose is to die is to make sure you obey the will of the father that's first and foremost secondly the second thing that you want to do when your life purpose is to die is to go through the process. Jesus was aware that he would return to the Father, so that was reassuring. But guess what? Before he could return to the Father, he had to endure 33 years of being on this earth. He had to endure the bloody cross. He had to experience death. He had to, um, he could enjoy resurrection, but he also had to endure the cross, the death, the, the sacrifice, the weight of sin. His body was divinely prepared by God and that by which salvation would be brought to men. But however, there were some things that had to happen before we even got to that point. 33 years of stuff had to happen before we even got to that point. Matthew 1 and 21, we see that Mary shall bear a son. He shall, we shall call, she shall call his name Jesus and he will save people from their sins. That's the purpose. That's why he came. How's he going to save them? He's going to die. So there's a lot that he has to go through, including nine months in the womb, including um, leaping in the belly, including the birth in the stable, including, you know, going into the temple and being away. There's so much that has to go through the process for him to fulfill his purpose. So the very next thing that he has to do is to understand that there is a process that he's going to be going through. It includes a trip to Bethlehem, a birth where there's no midwives. And, and though I haven't had children, but those of you who have had children, just imagine what it would have been like to give birth to a baby. You didn't have no coaching. You didn't have no Lamaze class. You didn't have nobody saying blow. Put me. Joseph didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> Joseph wasn't saying breathe, Mary, breathe. I mean, if he did, it was just through and by the Holy Spirit because Joseph didn't know what he was doing. He he basically found out she was pregnant in a dream and then he took her, you know, away so that, so that, you know, put the Bible says he put her away privately so that she could go ahead and have the baby. So the thing about it is that imagine having your baby and Ma B, the mother of our church, I think she got like six or eight kids. Imagine having every one of those children and there was nobody there to help you through the process. There was nobody there rubbing your back. There was nobody there telling you to breathe. So this is what she had to go through. This is what the process was. And so then after he goes through that process, you have the fanfare of the angels who sung the praise of his coming. Right now, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. We're celebrating, um, um, you know, we have the Christmas trees lit and the angels are singing and the Christmas music. But there was much more to this process than just his birth. We cannot focus on the birth 
of our Savior without focusing on the purpose of his birth. Somebody needs to get that right there. We can't focus on the birth. We can't focus on what happened when he was born without focusing on the purpose, why he was born. Was, his, was he born to save man? Absolutely. To serve God in man? Absolutely. Was he, pur was he purpose? Was he born to abolish the law? Absolutely. Was he born to teach the truth? Yes. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Was he born to heal the sick and raise the dead? Without a doubt. That's what he did and that's what he still does. Was he born to show love unconditionally and to make sure we have peace? Absolutely. He is the embodiment of love and peace. Yes, 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 those are all the benefits of his coming. Those are the fruits of his coming. But the purpose of his coming was so that he could die. I want y'all to pay attention to this. I want you to make sure you realize that Bethlehem only happened so that Calvary could happen. Christmas only happened so that Easter could happen. Angels only sung at his birth so that the demons in hell could scream at his resurrection. God knows I'm preaching this to myself. It's, 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 he had to make sure that he performed the will of God and, and all of that happened on the day that he was born. He said yes <coughs> to the will of the father, but he said yes to the father in birth so that he could say yes to the father in death. So it's important that we make sure that we understand that he had to endure the process. It wasn't just about his birth. It wasn't just about Bethlehem, but he had to endure the whole process. So what's the process? Well, we have to understand that he gave us something that we could never have ourselves. He gave us salvation in a sin-ridden world. He substituted himself when the blood of sacrifices could no longer please God. He gave himself in Wanda's place. Ezekiel says that the soul that sinneth shall die. And we all know the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And sin, because of the justice of God, is punishable by death. What does this mean? If you sin, then you die. It's just that simple. If you sin, then you die, both spiritually and and physically. But listen, y'all, God loved us so much that he set aside his deity. He set aside his godliness. He set aside that, that second person of the Trinity and, and jumped into humanity so that he could allow his son to shed his blood as a sacrifice. And in Hebrew says, once and for all. Guess what? That means we don't have to die. And, and, and this is something that I often say when my, when my, when my father passed, I was in the room. He didn't die. <laughs> he transitioned. That's what the mm -hmm. praise God. That's what the word transition mean. That means the Bible tells us that if we are a Christian, we don't have to see death. We transition. <laughs> we move from this side to be with the father. We transition. So Romans eight and three says for what the law was powerless to do. It didn't have the power to do because it was weakened by the flesh and greater faith. Y'all know we've talked about this. How was it weakened by the flesh when Adam sinned? So God, by sending his own son, and y'all know what? I'm just going to stop because this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. I got to stop here and I'm stopping because I just love the language of the Bible. <laughs> I just love how God revealed himself through the word. Listen to what he said. He said, God did this by sending his own son and the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So in flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so the process included suffering. It included humiliation. It included ridicule. Y'all know the story. I don't have to tell you the story. It included ridicule and humiliation and shame and hurt and condemnation. And listen, y'all, his process included everything that the enemy tries to put back on us. Somebody needs to hear that today mm -hmm. on Facebook. It includes everything that the enemy tries to put back on us. But guess what? Today, we don't have to walk in fear. There is no condemnation to us. We can have peace. He endured everything. Watch this. He endured everything that we had to do to endure, but he stopped at the cross. 
He endured everything that we have to do, endure, but he stopped at the cross. We don't have to endure death. Why? Because he did it for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he died. Our physical bodies will die, but our spiritual man will never die. The Bible says this. What do we say at the funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. He blew unto us. He made us out of clay. This physical body will die, but our spirits will never have to die when we accept Jesus Christ. We don't have to endure that because he's already endured it for us. He was born for this purpose. He has drunk the bitter cup of Calvary. He's bore every sin. He's felt every weight. He felt it for murderers and liars and adulterers and those who are disobedient. He felt it all because he knew that was the reason why he was born in a manger. He bore his sin, our sins, in his own body. He didn't know any sin. He didn't have an awareness of sin. He did not sin himself, but he who knew no sin came so that we might become the righteousness in him. So first of all, he came so that so that he could understand the purpose. He came for a purpose. And that purpose is to make sure that, that he obeyed the will of the Father. And then it was to make sure that he went through the process. So the third thing, the reason why um, he, he came and he died and he knew that, that this was a part of what he has to do was because he had to fulfill the purpose. And John 10 and 18, he says, listen to this. John 10 and 18, he says, no man takes my life, but I lay it down for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no man takes my life. He, it, it's almost like he, he, he kind of sort of sets to say, he said, oh, 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 oh let, let me, let me get this. Let me get this straight. No man takes my life, <laughs> but I will lay it down because I know my purpose. Romans 5 and 8, Paul says, but God commendeth his love toward us. How? And that while, we'll, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's him fulfilling the purpose. He laid his life down. He died for us while we were yet sinners. He fulfilled the purpose of giving us eternal life. Guess what? We didn't ask for it. We didn't even know that we needed it. We don't deserve it. We can never work enough to pay for it. But because it is a gift, the Bible says the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. And because he followed the will of the father, because he followed through with the process, because his mission and his purpose has been completed, we are free from the penalty of death because of his death. Because of his resurrection, there's no way to get to heaven outside of Christ. What does he say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So our purpose, our personal purpose can never be fulfilled until we connect fully with the fu fully with the son. Our purpose will never be fulfilled until we are fully allowing his, his purpose to embark and embrace our lives. Let me give you a, a good example. Let's just say hypothetically that you want to go to King's Dominion, okay? And um, you want to go to King's Dominion, but however, you don't have the money for the ticket. Okay. You don't have the money for the ticket. I want to go to King's Dominion. I don't have the money for the ticket. So Ron has agreed to pay the price for me. Okay. Ron has agreed to pay the price. So he goes to the ticket booth. He gives them the money. He gets the ticket and he comes back and he has the ticket. He's already paid the price for the ticket. And so what I'm going to do from that point, I'm going to go to D and I'm going to go my mom, to my mom and say, hey, I want to go to Bush Gardens or King's Dominion. But Ron got the ticket. Well, then what would you what would you say? Well, you need to go to Ron <laughs> and get the ticket from Ron. Am I right? It's the same thing with, with what he's done. He says, no man cometh unto the father, but by me. Why are you going to go through somebody else when they didn't pay the price? Why do we have to go through him? He paid the price. Go to the person who put, who put who put something out for it. Go to the person who sacrificed. Go to the per, to the person who shed his blood. Go to the person who made the commitment. Go to the person who paid the ultimate price. And guess what? Y'all really ain't ready for this. Guess what? I can go to Bush Gardens as often as I want to because when Ron paid that one ticket price, it covered everything. It covered this season, next season, the season after that. 
that? Because he paid the price once and for all. And that's what Jesus did for us. He paid the price. He brought our ticket to eternity. He brought our ticket to salvation when he shed his precious blood. There's nothing that I can do. When Juan gives me that ticket, he's going to say, Wanda, here's the ticket. Girl, it's a gift. How much do I owe you? You can't even afford it. I mean, it's the case of me. I know. The price is high. You can't afford it. So here's your ticket. Here, it, nothing. It's a gift. Don't worry about put your. And what's that old people say? Put your money back in your pocket. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. There's nothing that you can do. Put your money back in your pocket. There's nothing that you can do because the price has been paid once and for all. He did it. Why? Because he loved us. He did it. He came. He was resurrected. He paid the price for our sin. He opened up the path once and for all so that we don't have to live a life full of sin anymore. We can be free from sin. We can be free from every plight of the enemy. We can be free from condemnation. We can be free from everything that the enemy puts before us. We can be free. And so don't allow the enemy to hold that stuff over your head. Don't allow the enemy to make you feel condemnation. Don't allow the enemy to make you feel like um, you're not worth anything. Don't allow the enemy to make you feel like you don't deserve anything. Guess who thought you deserved it? God did. <clears throat> he thought he why did he why did he feel like you deserve it? Because he loves you. That's 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 it. That love that he gives for us unconditionally. It doesn't make a difference what we've done. It doesn't make a difference what we're going through. None of that makes a difference. What makes a difference is the fact that guess what? He died for us. He loves us. And that's, that makes all the difference in the world. So listen, this is, why I'm, this is how I'm going to close this. I want to give you a quote from John MacArthur. Um, John MacArthur, and this was in December of 1970. Listen to this now. Jesus Christ gathered up an eternity of punishment. An eternity. What does that mean? That means the punishment for my sins, Ron's sins, your sins, Mary Hall's sins, Della Tomlin's sins, Whitney Ballard's sins, um, Sister C. He pulled up all of the weight and the punishment of, of our sins. Jesus Christ gathered up an eternity of punishment. Watch. And paid it all in three hours and walked away from it as a risen Savior. Now that's power. I'm going to read that one more time. Jesus Christ gathered up an eternity of punishment, paid it all. How, many, how long did he stay on the cross? Paid it all in three hours and walked away from it as a risen Savior. Now that's power. Jesus Christ is our perfect example of purpose fulfillment. Listen, for those of you who are wrestling with why you're here, why you're still living, the answer's clear. You were not born to die. There's only been one person who's been born to die, and he died so that you don't have to. You don't have to be born to die. That's already been done. But you were born to give God glory through your life. How do you do it? The same way Jesus did. Number one, you obey the will of the Father. How do you know the will of the Father? Because you learn it through his word. You obey the will of the Father. Secondly, you endure the process. What's the process? Listen, and this is something that the Lord gave me as I was writing this this morning. The process, you know, we talk about suffering and, you know, you don't have to go anything. Nobody wants to go through anything. We talk about suffering when you are enduring the process. But guess what? If the truth is told, y'all, when we go through stuff, it's really not suffering. And I want greater faith. I want those of you who are connected with us through Facebook. I want you to change your perspective. When we go through stuff, it's not really suffering. It's refinement. I want, I want to let that meditate for a second. What does that mean? God is refining us. He's making us better. He's helping us. He's making sure that we have patience. He's giving us peace. How in the world? I, I, people let's say it all the time. Oh, God, you just got to give me patience. But we'll never want to go through nothing. We want, the, we want to learn how to love, but we don't ever want to go through being broken. 
So, so we don't suffer. He, he's refining us. He's molding us. And if anybody has ever been to a pottery, you know how they mold and shape the pottery. And, and even the Bible, I think it's in Jeremiah, talks about how the, pla- how the clay became marred in the hands of the potter. And when that clay became marred, marred he, he had to do it all over again. He had, so when we go through those things, he's refining us. He's molding us. We may look at it as suffering. We may look at it as trouble. We may look at it as tribulations, but I look at it as refinement. And so what's my question? God, how do you want me to make sure I'm fulfilling my purpose and what I'm going through? You've got to make sure that you endure the process of refinement. And then number three, you've got to make sure that you fulfill the mission. Christ did it all. We've got to make sure that we give him glory in whatever it is that we decide to do. Listen, don't do it half-handedly. Whatever it is that you decide to do, whatever it is that God is leading you to do for your life, your life purpose, his purpose was to die. That's it. What do you do when your purpose, when you know that you were born to die? We celebrate Christmas and that's great and we should, but we cannot celebrate Christmas without celebrating Easter. We cannot celebrate his birth without celebrating his death. And I know that sounds crazy, but we cannot celebrate his birth without celebrating his death. I know y'all thought this was going to be the sermon where the angels and lo and behold, there was a, um, the angels appeared to the shepherds as they were abiding in their, in the field, their flock by night. And certainly all of that happened, but why? Mm. Sure, they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirth to the child at, the, at his home. But why did that happen? So that he could die. So that mm-hmm. he could fulfill the promise. Certainly, um, they, turned them, they turned Mary and Joseph away. There was no room in the inn. They had to go out in the stable. We, we understand that. Every child that's ever been in church has quoted those scriptures probably. But why did it happen? So that he could die. So whatever mm-hmm. it is that you're dealing with today... If it's your purpose, if it's what you, what trying to figure out what God has for you, trying to figure out what God has for your life, the way to do it is simple. We emulate Christ. We do it the way Christ did it. We obey the will of the father. We walk in obedience. We endure the process of refinement and then we fulfill the mission. I think about, um, we have a couple of people in greater faith who are retired military um, and then, of course, my husband is retired military, and we watch a lot of army, um, army movies and things like that. And the one thing that I often hear them say is, like, if they get into trouble, the one question that they ask is, are we still supposed to fulfill the mission? And what is it that they come back and say, yes, either yes or no, abort the mission or fulfill the mission? And so what is it that he's saying here? After you obey the will of the Father... After you endure the process, fulfill the mission. Keep your head in the game. That's and, and, and I know sometimes the way that I say things is probably so elementary. But that's basically when it comes down to your life and your purpose, keep your head in the game. Jesus did it when he was at the Garden of Gethsemane. For one moment, he said, God, please allow this cup to pass for me. And almost in the same breath, what does he say? Whoa, not my will, <laughs> but your will be done. What, what, how can that be translated? Keep your head in the game. And he even said, listen to this, y'all. God, he just keeps giving this to me. Even when he was standing before Pontius Pilate, um, and, and he said, you know, and, and they were questioning him, why don't you do this? Why don't you, if you, haven't, if you haven't committed this sin, why don't you say something? He never said a mumbling word. Why? Because he kept his head in the game. When he was on the cross, when he was on the cross, the, the, one of the thieves said, listen, if you say who you are, I mean, summon legions, uh, summon, you know, get us down from this cross. He says, I could summon legions of angels and they could take me away from here. I mean, I could be almost in heaven in a blink, I'm sure. <laughs> That's very much paraphrased. But I could be to heaven in a blink. But guess what? I got purpose. I got to keep my head in the game with the weight of the world, with the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders. He kept his head in the game. He stayed focused. So what do you do when your purpose is to die? You want me to sum this up real real quick? Keep your head in the game. Obey the will of the father. Stay connected to his word. Endure the process, that process of refinement, and then fulfill the mission. Follow through. Do what God has called you to do. 
in this time and in this season. Listen, I'm going to end it right there. I, I just love this Christmas time. I love remembering Christ's birth, but I also love um, acknowledging his death. And, and as we lead up to Easter, I thank God for that. Um, the topic today was, what do you do when your purpose is to die? We've shared with you those points um, that you do. Um, if you have loved ones, family or friends that you would like us to pray for, we do have an active prayer warrior ministry. Um, we met this morning at nine o'clock to pray um, for those of you who have sent those prayer requests in for our church family, for our nation. Um, so if you have prayer requests, feel free to put those prayer requests here, or you can also send me um, an um, email through Greater Faith, um, greaterfaithndc at gmail.com. You can also send me a message here as well. Um, as we go into the holidays, as we enter into the holidays, Christmas is right around the, the corner. Um, remember the reason why he came. Don't just focus on the birth of the Savior. Don't just get wrapped up in Christmas gifts and the giving and the traveling, although I doubt we'll be doing much of that now. But don't get caught up in that. Um, just be sure that we remember that he came to die. That was his purpose. He had those little baby fingers when they were in the manger came so that nails could be put through them for our sins. So thank you all so much for joining me. Join us next Sunday, 930, same time, same station. We'll be here 930 to share with you more about what thus says the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us. I pray that you have a great Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye.